to. And today, that's right, and today there's going to be some spitting. I can guarantee it. Uh, we are in our series in First and Second Thessalonians. We are in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, and I will be honest with you, this is what I've been looking forward to for a long time. I don't know if you knew that this is slightly controversial in some circles, but this is an exciting text of Scripture. When I uh, was talking to the other leaders and we were talking about sermon series and, and maybe some of the things that we could do, and First and Second Thessalonians came up, uh, First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, jumped into my mind as one of those exciting passages to tackle because you're actually, we're actually going to have to tackle it a little bit today. Uh, I'll give you some background and some context as to like the different things that have been done with this text to help you kind of understand what we're looking at today. Uh, when I went to Bible college and to seminary, um, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 featured prominently in two different kinds of classes and, and different, like really varied kinds of classes. One of the things that we took was called pastoral care and administration. Um, there were classes like that at the college level as well as the seminary level. And those are the classes where they taught you how to counsel uh, people who are bereaved, people who have lost loved ones, uh, how to do hospital visitation, how to put together funeral memorial services. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 is a key passage in the pastoral care uh, as it relates to, pertains to um, dealing and, and helping people deal with death and, and care for those who have experienced the death of a loved one. So really important in that context. But then you go over to your theology classes, and usually you have to take eight or ten or so uh, different theology classes throughout the course of college or, or seminary career. And one of those is called eschatology, the study of last things, the, the end times. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 was the key text at both my college and at my seminary for a position that is called pre-tribulational premillennialism. Don't say amen. That'll make it awkward. Some people hold to pre-tribulational premillennialism. Other people don't. Don't say amen. It could get awkward, right? But in my theology classes, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 was a key text with regard to something called the rapture of the church. We'll get into the rapture near the end of the sermon. If you came here looking today for, for a, a chart, we got chart people in the room. If you came looking for an end times chart, I've got one for you. Some of you are going to be excited on the edge of your seat the whole time. Then we're going to get there. I'm going to put up the chart and you're going to be sadly disappointed. It's a real basic chart. But what I do want to focus on today is the, the text that, or the title of the sermon alludes to is why Paul wrote these words to the Thessalonian church. You see, Paul didn't write these words so that they could get into a theological discussion or debate. Interestingly enough, I went on Amazon this last week. I'm on Amazon a lot looking for books. Dr. David Jeremiah, you guys know David Jeremiah? Great Bible teacher, right? Great Bible scholar. He actually published a book on the rapture last week. You think that's intimidating for a guy like me? Okay, if I mess it up today, you can read David Jeremiah. That'd be great. Actually, it's very freeing. I can say whatever I want, then you can go read Jeremiah. The Great Disappearance, 31 Ways to Be Rapture Ready. Please don't download it while I'm preaching. That would just be offensive, <laughs> right? We'll stick with the Bible, then we can look at that later. Uh, many of you from the 70s are familiar with, with a book by a man named Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth. That kind of got a lot of this stuff started. Um, some of you of my generation or even later are familiar with Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, the Left Behind series, 15 volumes or something like that. And so those kind of books have popularized this idea of the rapture and pre-tribulationalism and things like that. Unfortunately, what it's done is for 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it's really drawn that text away from the primary purpose for which it's been written. And I want to declare to you today that we can learn some things about the end times, about the rapture, and we'll look at that. But primarily, we're going to see clearly in the very first verse that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonian Christians to help them understand how to deal with death as they awaited the return of Christ. And so I want to give full weight to the uh, intention and the purpose of the passage, and then we'll set it in the end, we'll, we'll set it in its theological framework and context very briefly. But I want to let you know that, 
Because some of you may come and think, we're going to have a whole sermon on the rapture, and it's going to be amazing, and it's going to be great, and you'll feel sorely disappointed when you walk away. But we want to do justice to the text as God has given it to us, right? So we'll do that this morning. In order to do that, I'm going to need some prayer. So I'm going to pray. You pray for me as I pray. Uh, God gives us wisdom in this text together. God, thank you again for the opportunity to open and study your word. We thank you that it is clear, that it is understandable as you desire it to be understandable. Help us not to try to look further than you intended. Help us to stay clearly within the realm of, of what you desired for us to know and see and understand here. God, give us wisdom uh, help us, help me to say the right things in the right way. I pray for everyone that's gathered here who's listening online, who will listen later, that they will hear as you intend uh, this message to be proclaimed. And God, that you would provide hope and strength for us this morning in a very real area in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, and right up at the very beginning, Paul will tell us why he was writing these words. He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers. We know from reading this letter and from the background that I've talked about in previous sermons that, w that Paul had, had been with this group of people, had started a church, and only after a few weeks he had to leave. And we know from, I think it's chapter 2, where he said that he wanted to be with them again to fill in the gaps uh, in their faith and in their knowledge and understanding. We know that he had taught them some things, but that he had not been with them long enough to teach them everything. And since this is one of the first, if not the first, New Testament letter written, they didn't have the Bible that they could go to and just figure it out. And, and so one of the key areas that Paul wants to address them on and fill in the gaps in their thinking, does not want them to be uninformed, is what he'll talk about here in just a moment. And I would say this, that we need our understanding informed. Our theology impacts the way that we live our life. Some of us will say, I'm not into theology, I'm not into thinking, I'm not in, I, just, I just want to feel. Uh, our theology impacts the way that we live. The stuff that we believe about Jesus, about God the Father, the stuff that we believe about the Holy Spirit, the things that we believe about the end times, impacts us. And so part of my job as a preacher is to do what Paul is doing here. And it says, we don't want you to be uninformed. I want to inform you through the Word of God. Inform your thinking. Help, to, help you to inculcate a biblical worldview and way of thinking about life. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed brothers about. About what? What's going to be the topic? About those who are asleep. And I know some of you think that's a few people in the back row. And it probably will be by the end of the sermon. It's okay. It might be a few of you up front as well. Somebody, as soon as I said the word eschatology, passed out. Right? I get it. In secular Greek usage, as well as throughout the Bible, the writers use sleep a as a metaphor, as a euphemism for death. Paul is here talking about Christians who have died. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. Why? So that you may not grieve. Now help me, is there a period at the end of that in your Bibles? So that you may not grieve. Is there a period there? Does the sentence end? And we're all thankful that the sentence doesn't end because he's going to talk about how we deal with the death of a loved one, how we deal with the death of, of losing someone who is important to us. And what he's not going to say is that Christians don't grieve. Please hear this carefully. There have been Christians who have said that it's not very Christian-like, or not very biblical, to grieve. It is biblical to grieve. We just grieve differently. And he says, we don't want you to grieve as others do who have no hope. Why was this written? It was to inform them about the fate of Christians who had died. They had lost loved ones. The loved ones were there. They had done the service, the funeral service, which looked different than we do it today, but they had done the, the service. They had spent the time honoring, remembering those loved ones, and those loved ones had gone into a grave of one sort or another. But now what? And there were some misgivings and some misunderstandings in their minds because they didn't have all the information. And so they had some misgivings and understandings about what then happened after my loved one died. We'll get into that a little bit more even later in the text. 
But Paul is writing this to say, we want to inform you about the fate of Christians who died so that we can stimulate your hope, so that we can encourage your faith, and so that we can temper your grief. All of those are pieces to this. What we believe about life after death has massive implications for how we deal with death, doesn't it? What we believe about life after death has massive implications for how we deal with death. Just yesterday, a couple of you were here in this room yesterday, and Pastor Lauren stood on the stage. We had the memorial service for a lady by the name of Millie Donahue. Millie has been coming to the church for maybe a year and a half, maybe two years before she got cancer, and she passed away. And yesterday, we had her memorial service. She was a faithful lady, loved the Lord. She would get me at the back door. She's like four foot something, like four foot and not much. And she would get me at the back door, and she'd start asking me real specific questions about sermons, which was really fun. It wasn't your classic good game pastor kind of thing, you know. But she would ask me real specific questions about things, and she was pretty direct, and it was great as a pastor. But yesterday, people came, and they gave testimony about Millie, her time in Bible study fellowship, and her time in church, and her time as a grandma and a parent, and all those things. And it was actually a great celebration. One of the strangest things that happened was actually before the thing even started. I happened to be up in the sound booth kind of making sure there was some pre-service music going. Typically at a funeral, you want to put something on so when people come and sit and it's quiet, it's not awkward. And I turned on the music and people were coming in. I came downstairs and I'm like, I can't tell if the music is playing. The people were so loud and talking to each other that I couldn't even tell if the pre-service music was playing. And I thought to myself, did someone forget to tell them that this lady died? Like, it was almost like there was a party going on or a reunion of some sort. These people were talking and high-fiving and hugging and smiling, and there was joy. And I'm like, you people are at a funeral. Have you been to a Christian funeral like that before? Have you been to a Christian funeral where you're almost scratching your head like, do these people really know what just happened, right? Throughout the course of that service, people stood on this stage. They cried, like real tears. Grandkids cried. Kids cried real tears. Pastor Lauren was here, and he's preaching. You think he cried a little? Absolutely, because he has a heart. You're like, Pastor Lauren preaches, he cries. He has a heart. I preach, I yell. It tells you something about him and me. Pray for my kids, right? But at the end of the day, there was grief, and there were tears, but there was celebration. Have you been to a non-Christian funeral? Two of the saddest funerals I've ever done were for two different young men in their 20s who lost all hope in life. It was a very different occurrence. There were some people who were trying to laugh and trying to make light and trying to do something to make people feel happy or feel better. But you know what was conspicuously absent from those services? Hope and joy. When Paul writes to the Thessalonians and he writes this controversial text that we have as chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, He's saying, you're going to grieve. Death is inevitable. Grief is understandable. But hope is available. And that's what Paul's getting at. That's the purpose. You see, in in that day, in the first century, in in Greek culture, really, for, for a long, long, long time, their understanding of death and the afterlife was a hopeless thing. They believed in something called the shadows, which was just kind of a, an existence for, for many, uh, the Greek mindset, was just kind of like this ethereal existence of life after death. So there was life after death, but there was no meaning or no purpose. They actually called it the shadows. There are even other examples from some of their poetry. There was a, a poet, a Latin poet named Catullus, and, and he said these encouraging words. We might put these on somebody's... Uh, uh, program at their at their memorial service the sun can rise and set again but once our brief light sets there is one unending night to be slept through you want that on your program like hey the sun's gonna rise and set you're gonna live once you're gonna die you're gonna sleep forever i know some of you are like sleep forever that sounds great right but there's just this hopelessness there was another poet theocritus and he wrote this hopes are for the living the dead are without hope. Like, really, that's all he wrote? He's famous? He wrote a bunch of other stuff, too. But as it pertains to death, he said the hope, hope is for living. Like, while you're alive, then you have hope. Once you die, no hope. There was an ancient Greek tombstone. True story. You can find it online. An ancient Greek tombstone 
uh, that was inscribed with these words. Maybe you want to write these down for your own. I was not, I became, I am not, I care not. That's hope-filled, right? A couple of you are like, hey, that's not a bad idea, right? I was not, I became, now I am not. Ah, who cares, right? One more, just for fun. S a second century letter. They found a second century letter. It was written from a lady. Her name was Irene. They have the letter. And it was a condolence letter. Irene had lost someone. It was either her, probably either her son or her husband named Didymus. And she was writing condolence to a friend, a couple who had lost a young son. So Irene's condolence letter reads like this in part, again from the second century A.D. I sorrowed and wept over your dear departed one. That, that starts off, and you're like, okay, that's good. That's probably what you should do. But really there's nothing that can be done in the face of such things. So please comfort each other. You know what, that lady is your friend? Job's up in heaven like, I think I knew someone like her, Right? These are just four examples of how the Greek mind in that day worked as it pertains to life after death. But let me ask you this. Has much changed in 2,000 years in our Western culture? Church, we have a cultural aversion to all things death, right? We have a major cultural aversion to thinking about death or understanding death in its context. And we're not here to say we should just celebrate and yay, woo-hoo, depending on who the person is, right? But at the end of the day, grief is understandable, but hope is available. Hope is possible. Remember that even Jesus wept, right? But there's still hope. And verse 14 helps us to understand how do we have that hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus... God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. That first part of verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, because of the way that's written, the words are used in the original language, m most scholars believe that Paul is actually quoting what at that time would have been a, an ancient church creed. The church had only been in existence for a short period of time, and already in, in small ways they had creedalized, they had, they had made these creeds of major important doctrines when he says we believe that jesus died and rose again what do we call that as christians we call that the gospel right that in its essence is the gospel of jesus christ when paul writes we believe that jesus died and rose again and because of that moving forward he's saying that this hope in death has to be grounded in the gospel like, hope in death has to be grounded in the gospel of Jesus. The reason that there was joy at Millie's funeral is because there was hope, because she was a believer. She's a Christian, and other Christians gathered together. And there was hope that was grounded in the gospel. Conversely, you go to a funeral of someone who has no real hope. There can be laughter. There can be jokes. There can be things that may seem like joy. But the hope is not grounded in the gospel. So Christians believe this about life after death. Christians believe that at death, the body goes into the ground, goes into the tomb, goes into the grave, cremation, whatever it is. That that's the body. And that the spirit then, your spirit, goes to be with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? Paul says it again, I think, somewhere in Philippians. That, that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. We believe that your body goes into the grave, that your spirit goes into heaven. And then at the end, at the end of all things, then there's a, a future bodily resurrection that awaits all people, but that the good news is that it awaits Christians. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says these words, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul's saying to the church, I came and I preached the gospel. Now when somebody asks you, like, what's the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 is the place you go every time because it outlines the gospel more clearly and succinctly than anywhere else in Scripture. 
He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that He was buried, and He raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Church, that's the gospel. That's the essence of the good news. That Christ died. We just sang about it. Christ died for our sins. That you and I and everyone else who's ever come into existence is a sinner by nature and by choice. Even if they do a lot of really good things, their nature is still sinner. And our identity is still sinner. And that Christ died to pay the penalty for that sin. But the good news is he didn't stay dead, did he? That he rose again, defeating Satan's sin and death. Church, that's the good news. All of our hope, all of our joy, all of those things are precipitated on the good news of Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian, you can have some kind of hope. You can have temporal joy, but you don't have true eternal hope and Christian joy without the gospel of Jesus, without accepting Christ and becoming a Christian. But not only that, as Paul delineates in these next verses from 1 Corinthians that I'll read, what we're going to hear about our future is dependent on, the, on Christ and his resurrection. It says this in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed, 1 Corinthians 15, 12, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. In other words, if there's no such thing as the resurrection, a lot of us have lost a lot of sleep on Sundays for no reason, right? I've spent a lot of time throughout the course of my life preaching and teaching the Bible to teenagers and adults. All of it's wasted if, it not, if it's not for the resurrection of Jesus. In addition to that, in verse 17, he says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. You see, everything is precipitated on the resurrection of Christ, the gospel of Jesus. And verse 20 says, In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are fallen asleep. What we know and what we understand is this, that hope in death has to be grounded in the gospel of Jesus. That if there is no Jesus and no gospel, there's no hope. But if you know Jesus, you know the gospel, then you can know what true hope actually looks like. Verses 15 through 17 then get really exciting. We're getting closer to that end times chart. I know some of you are pumped, three of you, maybe. But in verses 15 to, through 17, he's then going to lay out the nature of what this future looks like. He's going to lay out the nature of what this future bodily resurrection at the return of Christ, what does that actually look like? So like at the end of, the end of time, when we get to the end of time, and it's Jesus' turn, and he's coming again, what's that going to look like? And here's what I want to say. Christians disagree on the timing and the order of some of these events, okay? Definitely. Notice I said Christians, right? Christians disagree on the timing and the order of some of these events. There's at least three different ways to look at all of end times. You have premillennialism, you have postmillennialism, and you have amillennialism. I'm not going to explain those today. You're welcome, <laughs> right? If you're a premillennialist, like this, the official stance of this church, then you're in even more trouble because then you had to figure out this thing called the rapture, and there's at least three ways to look at that, probably four. You can be pre-tribulational rapture. You can be mid-tribulational rapture. You can be pre-wrath rapture, which is a little bit different than mid-tribulation, but not much. Or you can be post-tribulational rapture. And good people hold to all of these positions. I know good, Bible-loving, God-fearing, Jesus-exalting Christians who are amillennial. I know the same who are post-millennial, and I know even more who are pre-millennial. And I know a few who are pre-tribulational. Now, the pre-tribulational, pre-millennial view is actually a, a pretty strong minority among Christians and evangelicals. Some of you are like, really? We're on the team of the people? Yeah, right? It's like the Mariners. You're like, oh, okay, I get that. Makes a lot of sense. And it's not my goal today to lay all of that out for you, but what I do want to say is this that good Christians hold to all of these different views. But what we all agree on is this. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming to deliver his people. Jesus is coming to exercise judgment on an unbelieving world. Christians believe that. 
We might not agree exactly when it's going to happen or what the circumstances around it are going to be, but we all agree that that is going to happen, that Jesus is going to come again himself bodily. All Christians believe that, that there's going to be like a future resurrection. There's going to be a future resurrection. Like dead people are going to rise. The body and the soul, the spirit, are going to be reunited. So as I read these things in verses 15 through 17, understand that this is like the clearest picture we have of what happens at the return of Christ. We'll disagree on exactly how it happens, but what happens, this is crystal clear. And here's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to be a little bit awe-inspiring. You ever read Revelation and you're like, what is all this stuff going on? Part of it is written that way so that it inspires awe. It's also supposed to be, it's supposed to fuel our faith. And it's supposed to energize and encourage our hope, which is what he said he's writing this for in the first place. So as we read and we dig in and we understand this, remember the goal is that our hope and our faith are strengthened and encouraged. Because in verse 15, he'll say this. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. And Paul says that when he wants to be crystal clear. Like, this is from God, not my ideas. This isn't a guy creating a fiction book series about the end times, right? This is Paul speaking inspired words, writing inspired words through the Spirit of God. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord. That's Christians who are still alive at the end times. When the Lord returns, there will be Christians who will be alive. It may be you and me. It may not be, right? But when, when Christ comes, there will be Christians who are still alive. And he says this. Those who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede or take precedence over those who have fallen asleep. It's almost as if Paul is saying that there's going to be a race to meet Jesus, and if you're still alive, second place. Sorry, right? Now, I asked this to the first service. I'll ask you and see how spiritual you are. How many of you, like, want to be there alive and present when the Lord returns? How many? Come on. This isn't a trick question. I got people excited. I got people like, I'm not sure. Yeah, sign me up. And most of you know it's coming soon, right? As a matter of fact, some of you are pretty sure it's coming before the next election. And I've got good news for you. There's a way to find out. I found this out last night. This is a true story. If you go to raptureready.com or .org, don't do it now. Please don't do it now because you might freak out. But there's something called the Rapture Index online. And they take about 30-some different things that are going on in the world. And they've been doing this since like the 80s. And they take all those things and they create what they call the Dow Jones Industrial Average of the End Times. That's what they said, not me, okay? And what they do is they give you an index number. The lowest it's ever been has been in like the 60s or 70s. Like the number was like in the 60s or 70s. The highest it's ever been was like during the time of the Gulf War, I think. And it was at 188. Now the higher the index, the more likely the second coming. As of last night, you ready? What do you think? One, eight, (laughs) thousand, 186. Some of you are taking the seatbelts off. Come on, Lord Jesus. Right? We get so wrapped up in some of the extra things that surround what is actually supposed to be going on here that we kind of forget that what Paul is doing is telling us something that we're not supposed to know all about. But here's what I want you to get from verse 15. In our world, in our culture, as most cultures throughout the world, we see death as a disadvantage. And what Paul is talking about here is saying that death is not a disadvantage. He says that we who are alive at the second coming are going to be raised. He'll say that in a minute. But we're not going to precede the dead. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. It's almost like he's saying there's a priority of position. And here's what was happening. Some of their faulty thinking in that day centered around a belief that their relatives who had died either had missed or would miss the day of the Lord. That their relatives were going to miss this grand, exciting, amazing event. And so their faulty thinking was like, death is a disadvantage. They're going to die, and if the Lord comes while we're still alive, we're going to make it, and they're going to miss it. And Paul flips that, and he actually says, no, no, no. Death is not a disadvantage. It is, in fact, an advantage. And we need to change our thinking. You see, for me, 
death is a disadvantage to me when I lose a loved one. Is it a disadvantage to that Christian loved one? Absolutely not. You want to tell Millie Donahue, who's with Jesus right now, living the life, getting a much better sermon than this one, you want to tell her that she's at a disadvantage? No way to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And it changes the way that we think about and perceive and understand death. Is there still grief when the Christian dies? Absolutely. But if I really believe what I say I believe when I go to the funeral, they're in a better place. If that's really true, then death really isn't a disadvantage for them, is it? That is some hope that you can bank on. That is some hope that you can take with you and really be strengthened by. And that's what he's doing in these verses. In verses 16 and 17, he gives us this amazing picture of exactly what that's going to look like when Christ returns. There's two really important words. I'll be brief on this, but two important words that Paul uses. One is in verse 15. Uh, one is in verse uh, 17. And I want to point those out because he's using them on purpose. And remember, the New Testament was written in Greek. Greek had uh, some technical terms for different things, and some of those are used here. So when he says in verse 15, we who are left until the coming of the Lord, the word coming is the word parousia in Greek. It's been used a couple different times in this uh, book. In chapter 2, verse 19, chapter 3, verse 13, with reference to the coming of the Lord, the word is parousia. That word was, almost a, it was used often in a technical sense in that day to talk about when a dignitary or a king or an emperor visited your city. Parousia meant coming or presence. And so the king or the dignitary or the emperor would come to your city. It was known as the parousia. There's another word that's used in verse 17. And it says that we will meet the Lord in the air. That word meet is the Greek word apantesis. And that word is actually a, a counterpart in many ways to the word parousia. The first word that I explained means when an emperor or king or somebody comes into, is coming to visit your city. Apantesis is the word for what the people in the city do as that dignitary is coming. And the picture here is that the dignitary or the emperor is coming. The important person is coming to the city. Before they get to the city, the people of the city, Apantesis, they go out in pomp and circumstance and excitement in a big parade, and they meet that emperor or that dignitary. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a parable of the ten virgins, the ten handmaidens, and they go out to meet the bridegroom and then bring him back in. Apantesis, that's what they're doing. In Acts chapter 28, Paul is being brought into the city uh, of Rome. Some of the Roman Christians come out to greet him, the same thing, and then bring him back in. Most often when those words are used, the idea is the people come out, they greet, great fanfare, the important person is here, and then they bring them back into the city. That's not always the case, but usually that's the case. Why do I share those words with you? Because I want you to understand that when the writers of the New Testament wrote these things, they were giving flavor and color to it so we understood what they were trying to do. In that day, as the Thessalonian Christians got this letter and were reading it, it would have made perfect sense to them. Oh, parousia, apantesis, that, that makes sense. There's a dignitary, a really important person is coming. We're going to be called out to greet those people in great fanfare. This is an exciting day, an exciting time. You see the tone that it sets right there? Some of you I know are like, wait a minute, they brought them back into the city? That messes with my end times theology. I'm going to blame Jesus, not me. I'll move right along. <laughs> You're like, you have to explain it. I'm still looking for the explanation. In verses 16 and 17, we'll see four acts of this return. Verse 16, it says this, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. Now that's the part that I want to hear, man. That's the exciting stuff, right? The Lord himself will descend. He's not sending his minions. He's not sending his buddies. I know Matthew says that he's going to send out his angels to the four winds and gather in his elect. We believe that's going to happen as well. But right here, the Lord Jesus himself is coming. I got a half an amen. That's good, right? Like, you guys, we get excited about the Seahawks. We, they win a Super Bowl a decade ago, and we make a parade and welcome him into the city, and it's amazing, and it's awesome. The Lord is returning. That's, yes, yes, that's better, right? The return of the king. 
and it's going to be loud, and it's going to be crazy, and we're supposed to feel that. I don't know what archangels are or what they sound like. We know about one in the Bible. His name is Michael. Apparently, there are more, but if he's the archangel, you know what that probably means? He's probably in charge of lots and lots and lots of other angels. He's going to probably bring them along with him so that there's a whole host of angels, right? And you get to hear his voice. And you have to put up with my voice yelling all the time, I'm sorry. Right? When you get to hear Michael's voice or this archangel, whoever it is, their voice, I think you're going to know the difference. I told this in the first service that there was a man by the name of Jason Nightingale. I don't know if some of you remember Jason Nightingale. Big dude. Big beard. Very manly. And he w- had a ministry where he just went and quoted scripture. He memorized the book of Revelation, and he just quoted the book of Revelation. He had the manliest voice of anybody I've ever heard. Like, if you're asleep, and he comes in, and he's like, wake up. Yes, Jesus! Wait, what? <laughs> right? Can you imagine being this guy's kids? I would play that off all the time if I was him. Jason is now with the Lord. Jason Nightingale is with the Lord. And I'm pretty sure that the Lord is like, you got Michael, you got Jason Nightingale. Which one am I going to send at the end, right? Maybe he turns Jason into an archangel and sends him out. He's like, you know Revelation anyway, just go quote it. But what I do know is this is going to be an epic, amazing, amazing time. He talks about the trumpet of God. And the trumpet in the Old Testament, he's drawing on Old Testament imagery here because the trumpet was always something that they sounded to go to battle or to celebrate. Have any of you heard these stories of these twisted old pastors and what they did when they preached this? These guys were sick in the head. I've heard of people doing this. They'd put a guy with a trumpet back in the baptistry, and they would read this text, and then the guy would start blowing the trumpet, right? A bunch of people are like, yes! And then a couple guys are running toward the altar. Not yet! But it's going to be an amazing time. The trumpet of God. And then he says what? That's the return But then he talks about this resurrection. The dead in Christ will rise first. Meaning that the bodies of those who are dead, and you're like, yeah, but what about cremation? Like, I don't know. He's God. He can figure it out, right? The dead in Christ will rise first. Back in 1 Corinthians, again, 1 Corinthians is a great parallel to to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. But Paul says these words about the resurrection, the future resurrection of the body. He says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. If you've ever had a body part replaced, this is your verse, right? A bunch of you are like, oh, okay, yeah. We shall all be changed, right? My bad leg, my bad knee, my bad hip, my bad heart, my bad head, my bad voice, my bad... It's going to all be changed, amen? Amen? My gray hair, going to be changed. Somebody's no hair, going to be changed. If you say amen, you're indicting yourself. But it's all good. That's what he's talking about. This is called resurrection bodies. Romans 8 talks about it as well. But it's saying like all of you, if you've suffered from illness and sickness and bad things, it is going to be changed. The dead will be raised imperishable. We shall all be changed. This perishable bo- body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality. What shall come to pass? The saying that is written. Are you ready for it? Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen? O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our verse, Christians. That's what you have to look forward to. You can clap. I was going to tell you earlier. I was going to say this earlier because somebody, when the the band was back here and they were singing that song, sometimes, you know, we get excited about stuff, and in in our culture, we clap. Seahawks score a touchdown, some of us clap, right? Right? If you're here at the church and something gets you excited, a song, the word of God or whatever, it's okay to clap. I know enough to know you're not clapping for me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Right? Clapping. That's right. My kids are up here clapping. (laughs) Yes. But you want to clap for the Lord Jesus after a song or something because that's what we do because it excites us. And when he wrote this, I think that he had that in mind. So we will all be changed, experience that victory of God. And then that, that next word... It says, 
uh, verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. That word caught up, that's where we get the idea of the, the word rapture. So our, your English translation, mine says caught up. Some of them say snatched away. Uh, there was the, Greek, the original Greek word that then got translated into Latin. The Bible was, was translated into Latin. And the Latin word is the word where we get rapture. Okay? And so when you hear people talk about the theology, the doctrine of the rapture, it comes from the word in the Latin Bible used right here where it says that we will be caught up or we will be snatched away. It's used a few times in the Bible, um, but here specifically to the end times. So now comes that exciting time. Don't clap for this, but that exciting time. According to our church constitution and doctrinal statement, this church's stance on the end times is called pre-tribulational premillennialism. Again, if you hold to a different view of the end times, you're welcome here. We love you. We'll have great discussion and dialogue. If the Lord comes and you're right, feel free to taunt us. That's all good, right? But this is what it looks like in chart form, right up here. You're like, oh, it really is basic. Wow, what was I waiting for? But we believe that right now we live in something called the church age, and we've been living at that time since the day of Pentecost. And that the church in Acts 2 was started, and we've been living in the church age uh, that's there. And that at the end of the church age, at some undisclosed time, the rapture will occur. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. That's why it's in red. That what we've just been reading and talking about happens where that red arrow is. That the Lord will descend, that we will ascend, and we'll be there with Him. And then people who hold to this position believe that the Lord takes believers back into heaven for a seven-year tribulation period. It takes the church out of the tribulation, and that there's a time that's uh, specified in Revelation 6 through 18, that when you read that, all of that fits into this seven-year tribulation period. Then right before the, right at the second coming is something called the Battle of Armageddon. The second coming happens, and then there's a thousand-year, literal thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. That, that there's a time of peace and prosperity, that the things that, that the Old Testament said would happen for the nation of Israel in this time will happen for the nation of Israel. The covenant promises will be fulfilled. Then there will be a final judgment, the end of Revelation chapter 20, uh, and the great white throne judgment happens, all of those things, and then eternity, Revelation 21 and 22. That's one system of eschatology, one way of thinking about the end times. It happens to be the official position of our church, and so I want to give credence to that and also say again, I'd love to have debate, discussion, talk. Uh, I, this is an area of theology. We talk about some areas we hold with a closed fist. Jesus is God, closed fist. The Bible is the word of God, inspired and errant, authoritative word of God, closed fist. The Trinity, things like that. There are other things that we hold like with a cupped hand because they're really important to us. This is one of those areas where I got my hand open, my, my fingers are open, something may be pouring out here and there, right? That it's okay. We agree on the majors, we agree to disagree agreeably on some of the minors with this. So if you hold a different position, just hold it in such a way that's loving and kind and, and really think about what that means. Because what I know is that the end of this is the most exciting part and it says this the end of verse 17 it says we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air the final r so you have return resurrection and rapture but then you have reunion we believe that christians will be reunited with each other that you're going to be reunited with your loved ones who were christians who died that you're there's going to be a reunion like, that's the one that should induce some tears and some emotions, right? You've experienced loss. You're going to experience reunion. And it's going to be a glory. Can you think about that? I don't want to be the pastor that pulls the emotional strings. But you can think about what that's going to be like to reunite with those, lo those loved ones who passed away. And that's not even the best part. Because who else are we going to be reunited with? Jesus. And as much as I can't wait to meet my grandparents who I had never met or meet some of the people who have been very meaningful in my life who I've lost, I can't wait to meet Jesus. And you know what verse 18, uh, the end of verse 17 says? And so we will what? Always be with the Lord. We will always be with the Lord. Eternity in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Does it get any more hopeful than that? Absolutely not. And that is why verse 18 says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Why did Paul write it? 
so that we would have encouragement. Because church, we need encouragement in the midst of death. In dealing with death in the meantime, we need these words. I'll close with this. Yesterday at Millie's funeral, I was up in the sound booth again, and people were coming up, open mic, sharing testimonies and sharing different things. And one gal shared this quote. It wasn't from her. Uh, She was quoting someone else, and she said this, Grief is love with nowhere to go. Think about that. Grief is love with nowhere to go. You're like, that sounds pretty good. But I want to add this to it. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 gives your grief and your love somewhere to go. Grief is love with nowhere to go is depressing. But 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 that we just talked about gives your grief and gives your love somewhere to go. Because though death is inevitable, hope is eternal. Though death is inevitable, hope through Jesus is eternal. Amen? Let's stand together. I'll pray for us. God, thank you for a powerful text of Scripture. We thank you that you inspired the Apostle Paul to write down these words. We realize they've been used for a variety of reasons throughout the course of church history and even now. God, we're thankful for what we can know and, and, and learn and understand about the end times, but we're really most thankful for it because of the hope that it gives us. Especially today, Lord, in this text, that's always been about providing comfort to grieving people. I pray that it would do what you've intended it to do today. That it would provide hope to people who are, are grieving. That it will provide future hope to people who will, will grieve in the future. God, that it would provide maybe an impetus for someone who doesn't have hope to accept Christ as their Savior and to begin to understand what true hope looks and feels like. God, we're thankful that although we can spend time debating and discussing and talking about end times activities, that we know without a doubt that Jesus is coming. And it's going to be powerful and it's going to be positive for those of us who are Christians. So God, I pray that we would walk out the doors today with our hope and faith encouraged and strengthened, that we would live for you right now, because although death is inevitable, God, we know and we realize that hope in Jesus is eternal. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. As you're on your way out the door, church, again, if we can help in any way, uh, the app is there. You can also find some materials right back on the Connect table. Thank you. Have a good week.